Hey class, this week we're talking about early Stoicism. The early Stoics were among the first in the Western tradition to give us a cosmology, a metaphysics, a view of life and nature that resembles something like a systems view or something like cybernetics and complexity theory, what will develop into integral ecology. So we're going to be looking at the metaphysical underpinnings and cosmological worldview that they constructed and look at how that influenced later thinkers, especially Félix Ravisson, who wrote the essay that we read on Stoicism. So it's a kind of two for one. We're going to be talking about ancient Greek philosophy, Hellenistic philosophy, Roman philosophy, and its influence on later thinkers, in particular Ravi Son, who was a French spiritualist philosopher who had a very strong influence on Henri Bergson, who we're going to be looking at later, and Maurice Merleau-Ponty, the phenomenologist, who we're also going to be looking at later. So we're seeing here not only this historical development, but many elements of metaphysical theory, which are encapsulating these key insights of integral ecology. Stoicism began in Athens around 300 BC and was continued into the Hellenistic period and into the Roman period, um, which is the Stoicism that most people are familiar with. But these early Stoics is where we really get this view of nature and the cosmos that are very similar to integral ecology and the metaphysics that we're looking at this semester. They had a sort of dynamic process-oriented cosmology that took movement, development, life, organism, and consciousness as the fundamental aspects of reality and nature. The first major Stoic philosopher was Zeno of Critium, and his immediate successor, Cleanthes, and then Chrysippus. Unfortunately, the works of these philosophers have largely been lost, and all that remains is fragments in the form of quotations of other later writers, especially people like Cicero. And unfortunately, these philosophers are, generally speaking, not Stoics. And so there's a big you know, difficulty there where we can't always trust these quotations and they're all fragmentary. So it's very difficult to reconstruct exactly the worldview of the Stoics. But someone like Félix Ravisson, who wrote this essay that we're reading, does a great job of putting it all together in a way that really lends itself to this reading that I'm giving, which is in line with integral ecology. So that's what we're going to focus on here is this kind of particular reading of early Stoicism that inspires a lot of the 20th century thinkers such as Henri Bergson and Maurice Merleau-Ponty. Now central to the Stoic metaphysics is this idea of tonos. Tonos is a Greek word that has a very broad meaning. It was used by Socrates and it has a musical connotation to it. Tonos just means tone in its most basic meaning, uh, but it also can mean a scale, a certain set of notes played together. So if you wanna play something sad, you need to play the scale, the tonos, that properly conveys that emotion. So it has this sense of organization to it as, as well as a musical tone. And along with being a musical tone, it's a sort of vibration or a tension, right? Like the tension of a string, you tighten the string and then it has a certain vibratory frequency to it. So tonos also gets at this idea of vibration and tension. And the last puzzle piece here is that tonos also means striving and effort or straining, right? Just as we tighten the string in our psychical life, in our consciousness, 
we intensify our action in effort and in order to strive for something. So all of these ambigu all these ambiguities in the term tonos are supposed to come together to inform our view of tension as a kind of inner life that has a vibration and a kind of overall organization of tuning all of these parts. So a living organism is a collection of a multiplicity of tensions within it. There's the movements within the digestive system. There's the, uh, you know, even the, the word tonos can refer to the tension of a sinew or a tendon. There's the tightening of muscles in order to move around in the world, tightening and relaxing. All of these fluctuations of intensity organize into a well-tuned, well-organized system that is the living being. And they all have together one sort of tone or one tonos that is the living energy of that organism as a whole. And the universe itself has a kind of tonos or a kind of overall organizing tension to it that is the ethereal substance, the fiery substance underlying all reality. So for the Stoics, when I say that tonos is the basic metaphysical notion, what I'm saying is that every reality in the world, in nature, even in our consciousness, our inner life, is just a varying degree of tension of the same ethereal substance, which they call fire or reason or also pneuma, pneuma, spirit. And as we'll see, all of these are different aspects of the same reality, which is this living tension, this effort, this intelligent activity that at varying degrees comprises the entire physical world. Now, the Stoics are, in a way, rationalists. They think that reason is the underlying basis of all reality. But as we'll see in Stoicism, everything is a kind of paradoxical tension, even in their ideas, even in their um, doctrines. So when we go for rationalism in the, Stoicis, in the Stoics, what we find is that their rationalism is a kind of materialism. So generally, rationalism is equated with idealism, but in this case, it is a kind of materialism. And here, two opposites are in tension with one another. And this goes back again to Heraclitus. The Stoics use Heraclitus and Socrates as original forebearers of their thought. And Heraclitus says that it's the backstretched harmony of both the bow and the lyre, the bow being like Apollo or a, you know, archer's bow, and the lyre being a stringed instrument. So it's the tension, right, of both being at variance, you know, the, the bow is a kind of symbol of war, and the lyre, a symbol of music and peace and tranquility. Um, so it's the way in which there's a harmony between variance and harmony and agreement. Um, that is at the basis of all reality and all being. So that's their, their idea of tension. And within philosophical concepts like reason, we also have this tension going on. So on the one hand, reason is a kind of deterministic principle. And on the other hand, it's the principle of freedom. It's the principle of free action. A stoic sage, as they say, acts purely out of reason and therefore has the same will as the divine fiery intellect of God. Basically what this means is that by acting in a specific way, following reason, something comes about because it was a convergence of other causes coming together in such a way that they work together to basically have an emergent unity come about out of that multiplicity. And so reason is this kind of cybernetic principle for the Stoics. It's what guides movements to converge together so that there can be an emergence, basically, of some larger force, some kind of global uh, co cohesive force that is stronger because it puts all the parts together in a specific way. And so it's an organizing principle. And order 
and reason are two names basically in the Stoics for the same thing. So therefore, reason is really kind of like negative entropy in contemporary terms. It is what reverses this dissipation in the universe, right? If you have a potential difference, so let's say we have hot and cold, and we have like a divider, this is like a contemporary uh, thought experiment, and we remove the divider, the heat and the cold equalize so that that potential difference is eliminated, right? If we raise a ball up onto a hill and let it go, it will realize that potential energy. Now, the Stoics say that freedom is the realization, basically, of potential energy. It's the ability to bring together a multiplicity of tensions and intensities and forces and let them work together to release that potential energy. So the Stoics say that reason and virtue and knowledge are all the same thing and that all that they really are is following what is possible based on the intensification of etheric, fiery, pneumatic energy that is the effort of the divine will itself. Reason is therefore more akin to a teleological principle than it is a mechanistic or a efficient cause. It's not one thing bumping into another one and that's why something else happened just because things randomly hit into each other. No, it's a principle that guides and brings things together in a certain way so as to allow a higher level of order and self-order, self-organization to emerge. Let me say a bit more about their physics because this really brings all of these threads together in a kind of quasi-mythical thought experiment about the nature of, the re of reality and nature. So the Stoics believe that the most basic reality is fire, that the all of the elements in the Greek world air, water, fire, earth, our permutations are reducible to fire. And this comes, again, from Heraclitus. Now, generally speaking, when Greek philosophers say that everything in nature is reducible to one type of entity, one element, this is a kind of materialism. So, going back to Thales, the first of the pre-Socratics, he says that all reality is basically water. It's all permutations of water. He means that the underlying matter is water. And this is the way Aristotle frames pre-Socratic um, natural philosophy. Now, this is not really the case for Heraclitus, and it's certainly not the case for the Stoics. As I said, there's this kind of tension, theoretical tension, between uh, materialism and idealism going on here. Fire is an intellect. It's a it's a effort. It's a kind of tension that is living and that is creating and guiding, right? So matter ends up being a sort of mirror image of idealism. So that's one of the really weird, tricky tensions going on and paradoxes within the Stoics. So basically, the entire universe at its base is either whatever you want to call it, fire, reason, pneuma, intelligence. It's this bodily force acting in a way that brings everything together to create a higher form of tension, a higher form of intelligence, a higher form of organization. This fire not only penetrates everything in the physical world, it also, at moments within the history of the universe, within the unfolding of the universe, consumes the entire universe. So the entire universe is reduced to fire. And this is called the conflagration. So within periodic um, cycles, the entire universe becomes reduced to fire. And this fire is basically... God, but it's, for the Stoics, even higher than God. It's higher than Zeus. It's higher than any of the Greek gods. It is fate. It is intelligence itself. And the entire universe becomes engulfed in flames and then cools itself, relaxes its tension, and forms the entire material universe. And now, because this primordial fire, this intelligent uh fiery being has art within it, has intelligence, craftiness, inventiveness. 
it creates the entire universe, but because it's, you know, completely perfect, completely rational, it always creates the universe in exactly the same way. So this is the idea of the eternal return, another Nietzschean idea, similar to Amor Fati, taken from the Stoics, that really outlines the worldview that we're supposed to glean from this sort of mythical story of the cosmos. The primordial fire creates the world in exactly the same way, and therefore every event that happens within our lives, within the universe, will repeat an infinite number of times over and over again as the universe moves back and forth through its phases of conflagration and realizing all of its forms through world history. So the universe unfolds, unravels through an absolute determinism, but this determinism is very close to an ecological idea of interdependence. Every tension within the universe, every unfolding of action and movement is in a web of interdetermination with every other activity and happening within the universe. This is the idea of a plenum. There is this embodied movement between every node in this web and every transformation is sympathetic with every other transformation within the universe. And this idea comes back in Spinoza's philosophy much later, as we'll see. And what does this teach us? What does this tell us in ethics? Well, this idea of amor fati, the love of fate. If we can accept that everything happens for a reason, and that that reason is the guiding principle of all manifestations, then we can accept the way things are and work within that system as best we can, using our understanding, using our view of things as an expanding view, using our experiences to expand our view of the world, and using reason and logic and science and philosophy to better orchestrate, better cybernetically guiding our movement throughout the world. And this idea that reason is a negative entropy kind of principle, that it's a principle of self-organization, of convergence that brings together a multiplicity of forces and causes into a higher level of organization. This is evident to us, according to the Stoics, in our daily life, in our embodied life, through the phenomenon of habit. Now, a habit comes about by practicing something, right? Repeating a certain action. If I wanna learn how to ride a bike, I need to practice it. If I wanna learn how to swim, I need to get in water and start moving and figure out how to coordinate my movements. This activity of coordinating movements, this emergence of coordinated behavior is led by reason and is guided by this pneumatic, fiery intelligence that interpenetrates all reality and guides it to higher levels of order. So any kind of skill is direct evidence, according to the Stoics, of this tonos, of tension. When the parts come together, when they coordinate, a higher tension comes about and this effort brings them about. So the effort striving to form a habit is what actually causes and is the reason that brings about that self-organization. And when we look at this process, we are able to see direct evidence of universal tension at work within our own lives. And the Stoics have another term closely related to this, which is tenor. And we think, you know, tenor again is a musical term. What is the tenor of someone's speech? That means, you know, what was their tone? How did it, you know, what was its style? Were they spirited? Were they angry? Were they inspired? Were they kind of lackluster and boring or whatever? It's that kind of mood, that overall global qualitative aspect of the organization of all of their movements. They said all of these things, right? But the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. It's the way that 
everything they said came together and formed a whole. So this idea of tenor is closely related to the idea of tonos, of tension. It's a specific kind of tuning of all of the movements. It's a way that they organize, right? So each of us has habits, and those habits are a kind of tension among ordering, among uh, a multiplicity of movements. And then we have a tenor, which is the way all of our habits come together to form a larger global kind of gestalt, a kind of whole that is our character. That is the way that all of our life experiences, all of our habits converge and come together to form who we are, our persona, our personality, our quirky traits, our mannerisms, our style of being. All of these things come together as tenor. So tenor is another kind of cybernetic principle. It's a way of understanding movements as having form, direction, and a sort of guiding intentionality to them. And tenor and habit both involve feedback loops. There's the positive feedback loop intensifying our actions as, you know, you repeat a certain action over and over again and it becomes stronger and it becomes more of a tendency. It becomes more uh, precise. Our actions become more precise as we practice piano or as we ride a bike or whatever. The more we practice, a positive feedback loop brings that action to a higher degree and at certain points of instability, as they would be called in contemporary parlance, there's an emergence of novel order. A kind of metastable state emerges through the coordination of all of these movements with a higher degree of tension to it. Now, that higher degree of tension needs to be maintained at a kind of stable level through negative feedback loops, balancing this, you know, fluctuation of movements. And since every, you know, coordination of movements involves a multiplicity of movements, within that multiplicity, some movements move in one direction, some movements move in another direction. And these two directions need to be balanced out. And it's this balancing of all of these movements and forces that we call negative feedback, that we call metastable, that we call self-organization, right? So the tenor or the tension is always a balance of multiple forces patterned in a certain way so that the divergent forces don't move off in opposite directions, but come together and harmonize and reinforce one another. Therefore, the tension, the tenor, is not a totality of tensions. It's a sui generis tension that brings them all together, makes them into a whole. Sui generis meaning a unique form greater than the sum of the parts that includes all of those components in a special way so as to get more out of them than their individual parts that the whole becomes something more than the sum of the parts by being organized. And again, order is the same thing as reason. And so this principle of consciousness, of intellect, of life, of pneuma, of breath, vital breath, is what is responsible for every type of being, every degree of reality within being, from rocks to plants, to animals, to human life, to habits, to virtues, to intelligence. Each one of these is just another degree of tension, another way of organizing and animating the multiplicity in various degrees of tension throughout the universe. Closely related to this idea of tonos and of reason and fire is the idea of pneuma that I mentioned before. Pneuma is the Greek word for spirit or breath. Uh, think of pneumatic. These kinds of things are related by the Stoics as separate ways of viewing the same reality. We can look at it as fire. We can look at it as breath. We can look at it as tension. We can look at it as reason. We can look at it as ether. But really, we're looking at the same reality. The pneuma is a sustaining power, they say. 
it is a synecdoche, which is related to the word uh, con- continu- for continuity. Continuity, sustain, it is the cause of continuity. Synecdoche. And this describes a kind of force that brings cohesion, brings continuity, interconnects things, makes them uh, not just be atoms or discrete entities here and there, but brings them into a kind of network and interrelationality between each other, such that there's cohesion and a whole emerges that is greater than the sum of the parts. So the pneuma is a vital force that sustains the dynamic qualities and forms in nature and life, and is also the principle of consciousness. It is what creates continuity in our psycho-spiritual life. It is the sustaining force of tinsel movement, of attention. Tinsel, tension, these are kind of synonymous, and it's described by the Stoics as a double movement, a movement simultaneously in two directions at once, both inward and outward. This double movement of the pneuma is what brings unity to substances. So in the world, we have this kind of dissipative movement of things dispersing and falling apart. The pneuma is what brings them together and gives them cohesion. And they say that it is the outward movement of the pneuma that creates qualities and the inward movement that creates quantities. So qualities moving outward, you know, a living being has a multiplicity of qualities to it, and it is expressing different qualities at different times. So there's this outward movement of the pneuma creating qualities, and this inward movement creating quantity. In this sense, we can think unity. So pulling together, a unity is created, and pushing out qualities and processes and changes are created. And it's between these two movements, which are really one movement looked at from two angles, all differentiation and complexity of life emerges. For the Stoics, the pneuma pervades all reality and is the underlying cause of each thing being exactly what it is, rocks, plants, animals. The pneuma at a different tension creates different realities. The form of each emerges not merely from the matter composing its body, as in materialism and in atomism, but more importantly, the tension and interaction between corporeal parts and forces. It's this organization being held in tension by the pneuma that explains life and consciousness. Now, the Roman physician Galen gives us a wonderful explanation of this and brings out this idea of how this all-pervasive principle of Stoic, of uh, pneuma worked for the Stoics. He says, there are two kinds of innate breath for the Stoics, the physical kind and the psychical kind. The Stoics also posit a third kind called tenor, or in Greek, hexis. The breath which sustains stones is of a certain tenor, is of a certain hexis, a certain habit. And the one which nurtures animals and plants is the physical kind. Now, the psychical breath is that which, in animate beings, makes animals capable of sensation and moving in every way. So we see that different degrees of tension have different habits to them, different tenors. And each tenor is what makes possible a different way of being, a different type of being animals, plants, rocks. So the pneuma is both this completely corporeal reality as well as a psychical reality. And this creates a continuity, metaphysical continuity, between materialism and idealism. The tension is a sort of stretching here. It's tinane in Greek that holds the movements together. And in the way the force of a string holds together the string in its vibration. So the pneuma holds together all of these fluxes and movements so that a rock or a animal is what it is. Now, there's going to be this kind of quantum leap, a order of magnitude that we jump when the tension increases from one type of tenor to another, from physical to 
psychical pneuma. But we shouldn't think here that there is an ultimate gap between one and the other. And this is like the way we think now in terms of mechanistic materialism and biology, right? Life sciences. On the one hand, we have or self-organizing structures. And on the other, we have just dissipative movements spiraling out into entropy. That's not what the Stoics thought. They thought that at the lowest level, there was already order, already tension, and already holism, organization. Logos is not, again, this kind of like abstract thing that exists in some ideal world of forms, but is something that animates life and that brings it together and organizes it. And we can already see this in language. And the Stoics use a kind of phenomenology of language in order to understand logos more dynamically. The logos of speech is the intentional object, the meaning behind the words, right? There's letters and sounds. These are the elements that make up speech. And at the level of pure speech, there's the phonic movements, the breath and hitting your tongue against your teeth and things like that. There's the shape of the mouth and the tongue that's actually happening as a process. The logos is not simply this stream of babbling sounds. It's the meaning that is conveyed through these semantic structures, through the organization that they have, and by drawing on this whole history of the language. So when we utter a phrase, we gather and unify perceptions, memories, ideas, the concrete people and events of our life, and we articulate them in a coherent structure. The, the logos, in that sense, is this almost immaterial aspect that gives cohesion to all of the parts. By describing or explaining anything, humans make use of logos as this kind of inner principle that is akin to the psychical pneuma. We are habitually arranging things based on our rational abilities, using our intellect to understand and navigate the world, to order and kind of cybernetically make our way through the world. So the pneuma is not only this all-pervasive force, this principle within the world, it is also a principle identical to logos and therefore acting within our own individual consciousness.